Hello, welcome to the episode number three of the Art and Traveller podcast. I'm here in the beautiful High Peak, just outside of Whaley Bridge, with Gaynor Priest, who is with Spice That Does It, her business right here that operates out of Whaley Bridge. One of the first collaborations I had as a blogger. It's nice to see you. Oh, it's nice to see you. Nice yeah, to have you on the podcast. been a while, isn't it? It has a bit. Yeah, what, <laughs> three years now or something. I know. I know. Uh, Long time. More grey hair just in three years. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> oh my god. So, Whaley Bridge wasn't really on the map probably pre August, wasn't it? Pre August time. Yeah. And I remember sitting at home, I think it was the end of August, or not the start actually, it was the start of August, wasn't it? I think if I got the dates right. Um, I was in bed, it was a heat wave, I had the window open, and it was like someone was banging a drum against my head. Like, it was just thunder, rain coming through the window, which never happens. And it was like the most spectacular lightning show I can remember, but that was like the start of something quite bad, wasn't it? And Whaley Bridge with the, uh, the reservoir and the dam. It was, it was. It's funny actually, because every time someone used to ask me, where, you know, where do you live? And I'd say, oh, I live in Whaley Bridge, nobody's ever heard of it. And then I'd have to backtrack and say, well, have you ever heard of Buxton Spring Water? Mm. Well, we're about 15, 20 minutes from there. Now we go Whaley Bridge and they go, oh, yes, you're the, you're the village who nearly uh, got wiped out by the dam. Oh, yes, that's the one. <laughs> yes, so the, the dynamics have changed with it a lot. But uh, it, it, was, it was bad. There's been a lot of people saying it was a health and safety nonsense and all of that, but it was very scary. We were actually at work on the, it was a Wednesday um, and we were wrapping up at around five o'clock and um, we started seeing water coming in on our ground floor here. Oh wow. Um, so I decided to drive home and get my two boys and my husband and come back because I thought the first thing I've got to do with this amount of rain, if it is starting to come in, is to make sure all our stock and everything is, is off the ground. And in the space of half an hour of me getting home and coming back, um, there was about a foot of water that it was under already. So we came in Wellington boots, we were completely flooded, it was like a river downstairs. And then the water was just below our knee level. So where we're sitting right now, that would have been, we would have been pretty much up to our knees in water on the ground floor. Or we're, uh, we're, yeah, 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 absolutely, yes, you'd have a wet bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Soggy bottom. <laughs> yes. Um, so that was the Wednesday and we managed to, I mean, I think we left at about 11 o'clock at night after trying to get everything up and helping some other businesses as well who were flooding, everybody just mucked in together. Wow. So we went home at about 11 and we came in early the next day in our Wellingtons to try and deal with it, mm. but it was about, it was about 12 o'clock. Uh, we had the police come into the building and evacuate us from here because of the threat of the dam. As soon as that? As soon as that, yeah. Then I tried to get home, but all the roads were blocked off because they were trying to keep get prevent more people from going into Whaley Bridge. So luckily they let me through because I just needed to get home. I was very lucky because we're up further up on the hill, but it was two streets down from me where it was cordoned off in the village. So I was lucky in one way in that I was able to stay at home, but I had a business that was completely flooded. I couldn't get to work because they would let you out of Whaley Bridge, but they wouldn't let you back in because they had to keep that risk low, obviously. Um, so, and then that was the whole week. So this whole week, my business was in a river and I couldn't do anything about it. I was just sat on my hands. It was absolutely awful. Did you manage to actually save the stock in the end or was it? We lost, we lost about about thirty percent of it. So we did quite well, really. Yeah. But it is the clean up. We lost a lot of shelving in it because obviously we couldn't risk anything with the water being contaminated. So we had to take all our get rid of all our shelving units and everything, completely clean out, disinfect. We had special contractors come in to make sure it was one hundred percent, you know, fit for food and everything. Um, and then s bring in loads more shelving and stock up again. So it took us about 
three weeks to get back on our feet, excluding the week that we couldn't come back in. So it was about a month that it knocked us back. Wow. Just that. But then in Whaley, um, I mean, that was phenomenal one day to the next. You know, we would hear the Chinooks flying over our house every, all day from about five o'clock in the morning and they would stop at about two, three the following morning. They didn't have much of a break. I've never seen the services work so hard. They were absolutely phenomenal. Um, but it was scary because I remember talking the day that they opened it all up and everybody was allowed back into the village. Um, we actually stopped a policeman and said, you know, was it really as bad as they made out? Um, and he said, well, let's put it this way, the emergency service had had two and a half thousand body bags ready. And wow. that, for me, was a real reality check, because I thought, you, don't, you just don't keep those in the back of your car, do you? <laughs> you know <laughs> no, what I mean? Not, <laughs> no. So it was very real. It was very dangerous. If you look at the pictures and you zoom in, you can actually see a hole in the wall and the amount of water that was there. There's a village a bit further up from us called New Mills, and that is about six miles away, five, six miles away from Whaley Bridge. And they were saying that if the dam had gone, it would have taken 23 seconds for that water to hit New Mills. Oh my God. So it is like, it would have been like a tsunami. Yeah. It would have completely wiped out the whole of Whaley Bridge. Um, and you know, villagers going along um, right the way through to New Mills. They'd evacuated, I think, up to 10 miles away wow. along the river side, you know, not the whole yeah. villages, but anyone near the river. They'd evacuated all of there. So the dam's completely um, drained now. Well, it's, it's not completely drained, I lie. It's got a small amount of water in because they um, have to preserve, uh, look after the fish that are in there. So I believe it was, it's either last month or it's this month that they are moving the fish to another location, I'm not sure where. And then the idea is that they drain it completely um, and the pumps will stay in the reservoir permanently now in case we have freak weather like that again um, to make sure that we, you know, we're not at risk. But they're talking about over three years to rebuild the dam. They were contemplating just repairing it, but I think they, from what I've heard, and I'm not in an official capacity, um, I believe that they need to rebuild it. Yeah, it's a big job, isn't it? Yes. For, yeah. the, for those who probably weren't as familiar with what happened, it was, it looked from the pictures anyway, like when you fill up a bathtub and you get in it and the water comes over the side, such as the rainfall, but obviously that night, was it that kind of, all I could see was water just streaming down the side of it and obviously making the streams below a lot higher. So you've, you've got right. the instant risk, even if the dam doesn't go, of just you know flooding in the town on a sort of a ground level, I suppose. That's what happened. There were quite a few um, houses that were flooded yeah. because of the excess of water that was coming over. It, it was like a, a really high speed waterfall. High speed waterfall? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Coming down a, a huge mountain yeah. or a dam in this case. Wow, that's, yeah. that's incredible. I mean, everyone was glued to it throughout August. And, you know, obviously finding out that you were here, we've uh, worked together previously at a distance. But, you know, knowing that could have gone, you know, in seconds pretty much with the damage that was caused, that's a scary thought. It is very, very scary, yes. But luckily, thanks to the services and everything, everyone's safe. It was a bit surreal seeing Whaley Bridge, sleepy little Whaley Bridge village, all over the news, on Sky, on BBC. Every time you turned on the news, we were on there. It was just, you just, you, if you live in a little village like this, you just, it does feel really surreal, really weird. Oh, definitely. <laughs> well, hopefully now all's, uh, all's going to be fine with the rebuild and that all goes to plan. And yes. We can all uh, go yes. back to enjoying the reservoir and... Obviously, the, the scenery around here, if you, if you are listening from America, you're thinking of visiting the UK, the scenery in this part of particularly England is just stunning, isn't it? It's the, the best place to live. Well, one of the best places to live, surely, in, in the country. Absolutely gorgeous with the hills and the landscapes. And autumn is the best time, I think, here. 
because obviously you get all the changes in leaves, but because the scenery is so dramatic, if you um, drive to an area where you can see quite far, you get a real perspective of the change of the seasons and the natural beauty. Absolutely, I love it. Love it here. It's here fantastic. Too. It's stunning, <laughs> isn't it? So your business, Spicely yes. Does It. Um, for those of you listening who may not be familiar with the company, what's, how would you describe the company and what uh, products that you sell? So at the moment, we predominantly do um, kits. Um, it's almost like a food course in a box. And they are products, they are um, predominantly meat-based products, um, but they're teaching people how to make sort of charcuterie deli type um, meals, uh, not meals, sorry, meats, um, to cure themselves. So whether it's something like pastrami or making your own bacon or um, down the sausage route, making your own dry cured chorizo or fresh British sausages. Um, it's kits like that, so people often think that they can't do those things and they've got to leave it to either the butchers or the meat manufacturers or, or um, you know, people who are producing it all the time. But actually you get a lot of pleasure out of making them yourself and we've, our expertise have been taking something like that which is done in a very controlled environment on a large scale, we've downsized it all and made the kits so that you can do it in your own house uh, so we've we've done kits for curing that will cure in a quicker time it's quite a complicated um, process when you're curing meats so we've simplified everything with our sausage making kits for the fresh sausages we've removed a lot of the ingredients that you would use in mass manufacturing like shelf life enhancers and they need that really because of the journey that they go on with all the distribution centres and then sat on the shelves for however long they do. Um, they need ingredients in there to make it still look nice a week or two later so they might put colourants in or um, like I say shelf life enhancers to inhibit any bacteria growth that sort of thing. But if you're making them yourself you don't need any of those ingredients in there. If you want a longer shelf life you just pop it in your freezer. Um, so yes, we've simplified everything to make it easy. It's fun. We're great. We're very keen on trying to bring families back into the kitchen because I think we need to know more about how things are made, where everything comes from, how it was looked after. So many aspects to it. The quality of of what you're eating, what you're buying. Uh, I find food such an amazing thing and, and herbs and spices as well because you could take a, a piece of cod and add different herbs and spices and you could effectively create 20 different meals just with one one product like a, a, a piece of cod. It's very simple or, isn't it? Yeah and it's all the variations and, and the different ingredients together. It is like a painter's palette in the food world really and I think that's so exciting and I, I would I would wish for more people to feel that passionate about food. I think in the UK, through convenience foods and the large manufacturers, I think um, we've almost lost that skill and we're reliant on the ready meals and all of that. But if we could just take little small steps to learning a little bit about things and maybe trying something at home, something simple a little bit more and experimenting a bit more. I think that's important for our next generations, very much so. Um, because if you know how, where things are from, how they are made, you know, what you put into your body is going to have an effect on it because nutrition and food is what keeps us alive along with water but you know food is a, a big part of that and a lot of it can actually be quite medicinal to some degree oh definitely um and i think getting the next generation involved is really really important because they need to know where things come from and it has a knock-on effect because then we care more about our planet and our animals and our plants and and all of those things so how do you actually go about learning the skills of charcuterie is this kind of travel influenced have you been to i mean there's fantastic charcuterie in the likes of france italy spain 
uh, even further afield than that. You know, it does. It's quite a widespread thing, and every country seems to have its speciality. Yes. Was it learned sort of by travel, or was it by experimentation, or how did it kind of come about that you were going to go into the charcuterie route? As a family business, we were already in the ingredients industry, so we were supplying um, the large manufacturers with cure mixes and herb and spice um, seasonings and blends and and just the pure uh, herbs and spices in their purest form already um, and we were involved in the curing side of things you know a lot of charcuterie over here isn't as big as it is in Europe um, but we were already involved in that and I think I took growing up in a family with that already there it's the same as in Europe, a lot of the generations are brought up and they're taught how to make all of these things. So it does go through the generations. So that's where it came from really. And, and you know, in my young years, spent many years going round um, with my parents, down round the abattoirs and the meat manufacturers. So I know exactly the full process and what's involved from field to fork on a large scale. But I also saw a lot of things that I didn't like about it. And that's where my inspiration for the home kits came in, because I thought, well, people at home can do that as well, but at least they know what's inside, and yeah. they know where everything's come from. And they have a bit of fun doing it, and there's an element of pride at the end of it, you know, I, I've just done these <laughs> myself. I had trees on my airing cupboard, I never thought I'd have that, ever. <laughs> Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I recommend, well, it might taste a bit of, uh, well, don't put any towels in there, I'd say, just keep it as free as you can. I was can. going to say, how did it go down with the wine? It was very nice, actually. It was, oh, it was quite reminiscent of the stuff they've had in Spain, so I was, I was very oh. impressed. And adding red wine to the mix, if you, if you are looking at a kit, I will obviously put links in the description box for YouTube, iTunes, just head over to my YouTube channel, um, it'll all be in there, the kits and everything. Um, but the chorizo normally I would have well when I've seen it made it's been made with just the standard mince, paprika um, a few herbs maybe a bit of garlic something like that but to put red wine in it it makes that sort of authentic charcuterie style colour it really changed it so and again the kit was simple to use it's easy and it'll make a lot of them as well yes oh I'm yeah. glad you enjoyed it. Oh, I was delighted with that. I can yeah, highly recommend that one. Obviously, the, the other kits, we've tried the kebab kit, of course, taking it in kind of like a Turkish Cypriot direction. Uh -huh. You're kind of slowly conquering the world, one piece of charcuterie at a time. Really, <laughs> I am, I am. The kebab's my favourite. That seasoning in there is, is gorgeous. Oh, it's good kebab. stuff. We stick it on yeah. everything. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can, you can go further. Wash our that. hair with it. No, we don't really. <laughs> Times are hard when your town floods, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've run out of shampoo. What else do we have? <laughs> exactly. Needs must. Yeah. No, I suppose it'll smell nice like a kebab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, obviously you've got the business here at the moment that occupies a lot of your time. How do you spend your free time? Do you kind of, do you go away or do you uh, sort of spend a lot of time walking around the high peak? Or I think walking in the high peak, I've got two dogs um, and walking in the high peak really helps, really helps. I don't get a lot of free time, um, but that's what I love to do. If I, you know, have the free time, that's what my preference would be, is to walk around. It's just so calming and peaceful and you get a lot of head space and your heart rate's going up, so when you're finished, you feel a lot better, you feel more relaxed. It's um, very therapeutic, yeah. Definitely. You've got to when you're here. I remember coming here as a teenager and walking around the Dovedale area and sort of coming up to, not quite this high up, but sort of in the Derbyshire area and it was just, it was beautiful. You catch it on a nice day. We're actually recording on a very sunny day and it's lovely weather. It's a little bit cold outside, but it is October. So It is. With Christmas coming up, what is the Christmas day like or the Christmas celebrations like in your household? Uh, always at home. I always stay at home and it's always with the family, good company, good food, watching some chosen programs that we, you know, Christmas specials and that sort of thing. Lots of playing games, board games. Oh, I they love don't a board game. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't play enough of them, really. 
thing. No. They're really expensive now though. If you they go are. if you go to even on Amazon I think Monopoly is about I think some of the editions are up to fifty pounds. I know. So I you'd know. think they'd chuck more money in for that really, but yeah. stick to McDonald's. Yes. <laughs> no. No, no, don't. No. Yeah. We'll, we'll edit that bit out. I remember to. <laughs> so obviously, uh, yeah, Christmas fast approaching. Uh, do you anticipate quite an influx of orders for kits? From... It's our busiest time of year, so um, the cog starts turning now. Really, we just get busier and busier. We do long days at Christmas. You know, we we do six a.m to about 8 p.m. and we do seven days a week it gets that busy you know we sell thousands of the kits at this time of the year which is great because I envisage all these busy kitchens creating chorizo and bacon and all sausages and all of these things maybe not in their airing cupboard no <laughs> no <laughs> we've had some really creative ideas with hanging up the chorizo people have used coat hangers and washing lines and all sorts of things if it does the job you, you've got to get it done. exactly it's yeah. that initial panic when you've actually tied them up and then because i'm i got the kit out and i sort of didn't think ahead really i just sort of focused on filling the cases correctly and making sure they look they resemble chorizo because for the photos and obviously the finished product and then the kind of the dilemma struck of where to actually hang them. So, but, yeah, if you earrings. Are, yeah, earrings. Yeah, take them around town for a month. Yeah, yeah on a lead. Exactly. The choice is yours. The airing cupboard, I would definitely not recommend. <laughs> unless you've emptied it, of course. Yeah. Um. So you told me just before we started the podcast that you're actually you grew up in Africa. What uh, What part of Africa did you grow up in? Uh, it was Southern Africa. Um, all my family are British all over here, but my uh, dad went over there with work, um, so we obviously went along, and I did my schooling over there, and then came back to the UK, uh, to the rest of the family. So it was nice for me because I didn't grow up with the family around me, um, so coming back to the UK and actually having family around was lovely. How long in total did you live in Africa for? For... 21 years oh, that's quite, so a, long quite time. a long time and what's the what's the charcuterie like over there it's not bad um the it's very cosmopolitan over there um but it's probably more um barbecue based so it's in many ways it's similar to america where they also have charcuterie but there's a big focus on barbecues the weather's obviously a lot warmer out there so you know spending days by the swimming pool and having people over for beers and a barbecue um, it's funny really because I grew up on grilled meat or barbecued meat and loads of salads we would always have at least 10 salads for every meal that we had or well, function when I say function I mean people coming over you know for just a chilled Sunday so I grew up on grilled meat and loads of different salads, but it would be pasta salad and a green salad and a green bean salad and a potato salad and all these different salads. So when I came over back, well, although we visited every year because we came to see the family, actually living here with a completely different diet, I found quite difficult at first because everything's quite um, carb heavy here. Yeah. And nobody's that keen on vegetables, really, or salad. Not nobody, that's a bit harsh. There are quite a few people who are salad dodgers, aren't they? There are, um, especially this time of year. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I get that because the culture, it's a colder country, so, and I think things like pies and that go back to the miners' times and, you know, how they used to take their lunch was a pie, wouldn't it? It used yeah. to be made into a bit of a basket that they used to Almost carry. Almost kind of out of necessity, really. Absolutely, mm. yeah. So I can see why, but I think I would. I just wasn't used to. Although we, I had it when I came over on holiday. When you're on holiday in a country, it's very different to living in a country. Yeah. Very different. You get a taste of it, but living's different. So that was quite an adjustment for me. Uh, so. so one final question. I can't believe we've nearly done 25 minutes straight already. Oh, it, oh. it flies. It really does. <laughs> these podcasts. One final question is: If you had to have one piece of charcuterie for the rest of your life. What would that piece be? 
Pastrami. Yeah. Yeah. Pastrami. I think you can do all sorts with pastrami. You don't need to cook it. You don't need to prepare it. It can go in salads. You can stick it in toasties. You can... What else can you do with it? You can... It's hot. Stick it with it. Yeah, you yeah. can have it hot or cold. Yeah, that is it. That's decent. I'm quite into pastrami at the moment. Actually, oh, I need you? to. I need to start making some more. Um, I made it once. I think out of brisket, but I got coincidentally from a service station. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> of all places. There's a lot of love on this podcast for Gloucester services and obviously comedians. So that's okay. One, that's one for them. But if you're ever in the Gloucester area and you fancy uh, picking up. A random piece of brisket for pastrami I'd recommend Gloucester services that's the way to go <laughs> <laughs> it's been amazing to chat to you finally getting to meet you as well so uh, I really hope you enjoyed the podcast everybody um, like subscribe uh, if you're watching this on YouTube you can also subscribe on iTunes and I'll see you on the